The title of our sermon this evening, The Communion of the Saints, our text, primary text, Ephesians chapter four, verses one through 16. So we are back together this evening in consideration of our series entitled The Essentials, One Sermon, One Subject, and, uh, Essential to the Life, Health, Growth, and Maturity of the Christian. And tonight, we have the joy of looking at a doctrine that is familiar to our confession. It's a doctrine that is familiar to the great creeds of our faith, familiar to hymn writers, but unfamiliar to many Christians. Uh, tonight, the doctrine is the communion of the saints. Now, our confession of faith beautifully explains the communion of the saints this way from chapter 27, article 1, where our confession reads, all saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head by his spirit and faith, although they are not made thereby one person with him, have fellowship in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. And being united to one another in love, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, in an orderly way, as do conduce or lead to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. Now, that is an introduction, if you will, to the communion of the saints. In other words, no matter where they come from, whether those in heaven, whether those on earth, whether those in Zimbabwe or those in Tuscaloosa, no matter where they come from, no matter what time period they come from, from Adam to you, <laughs> no matter what time period they come from, no matter what language they speak, what nation they represent, whatever the color of their skin is, whatever the distance that would seem at first appearance to divide us, all the saints through their union with Jesus Christ, their head, are united to one another in love. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, that we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, the whole building now growing up into a holy temple in the Lord. There's something going on there, right, with our fellowship, with our communion one with another. Uh, by his spirit and by virtue of our union with Jesus Christ, we have communion with one another. Now, having fellowship in his gifts and graces in his suffering, his death, resurrection, and glory, our confession explains that we also then have communion in each other's gifts and graces. And the Bible expresses this reality in beautiful terms, in familial terms, often in terms of body and head. Uh, he is our head, and we are the members of his body and members of one another. That's the communion of the saints. That doctrine, that reality, that spiritual blessing, something that we should highly value and cultivate, labor, strive to cultivate among us. And it's something that is entirely foreign to most Christians. It's interesting, but it is something that is entirely foreign to most churches. Entirely, it goes unexperienced by most professing Christians and most professing churches. Many today pride themselves on rugged individualism, isolationism, right? How many people are used to going in the doors of a church, sitting down real quick to hear a sermon, and then bolting before to get to the parking lot to beat the Lutherans to the buffet, right, to get out of church because they don't want to have communion with the saints. Uh, and that's what we're used to. We're used to isolating ourselves. We're used to being very private. People tend to be unassailably private, really difficult sometimes to get to know people, Relationships tend to be very superficial. And I'm going to submit to you, brothers and sisters, we have to fight against that here. We have to fight against being superficial. We need to be invested in one another, enjoying the blessings that flow from the communion of the saints. Churches today... Uh, by many are seen to be little more than a common activity they share on a Sunday morning. They're little more than a, a, a social club. And besides possibly abstaining from cussing and coarse jokes, <laughs> there's likely little, if any, real difference between your friendships in the world and your friendships at the church, if you belong to a place like that. The church is far more than a common gathering spot and a common activity shared on a Sunday morning. There's far more going on there, 
right? Uh, Christians are saved to a living, breathing, growing, thriving, rejoicing, hoping, loving community. And that's a community that we are to cultivate. There's something going on there, and it's going on by virtue of God's Spirit at work among us. If you've been here for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's difficult to put your finger on, right? Maybe it's difficult to tangibly define, but communion of the saints is something that we enjoy and are blessed by, and it's something through which the Spirit of God works. The 18th century English Baptist John Fawcett was pastoring a small church in a rural town uh, when a large church from London offering a large salary came calling. Uh, Well, Fawcett accepted the job, uh, preached a farewell sermon to his home church, and after preaching the farewell sermon, they all gathered together outside the church building to help load his belongings, his family, onto a cart and send John Fawcett on his way to London. As they said their goodbyes, There was open weeping, to which John Fawcett finally responded, I cannot stand it. I know not how to go. John Fawcett loved those people. Those people loved him. He would stay and faithfully pastor that church for the next 54 years. He wrote this hymn that describes our fellowship together, the communion of the saints. Listen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. That's the communion of the saints, right? That's what he's describing. What is the tie that binds, by the way? What do you think that that is? Ultimately, primarily, predominantly, it's the Spirit of God. But he does so through means, and we're going to talk about those means tonight. Listen to the words of the hymn. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. You see how connected we are, how intertwined we are. When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. We, we, we hear that heart expressed all over the New Testament, don't we, by the Apostle Paul, right? I long to see you. I'm there with you in spirit, Paul would say, right? I long to be with you. That hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, expresses the communion that we share as being heirs together of the grace of life. The more that we grow in this grace, oftentimes you'll find, won't you, the more painful it is when that fellowship, when that communion is broken. The Lord Jesus Christ himself alludes to that same kind of spirit-wrought communion on the eve of his crucifixion in John chapter 17. Look there with me, John chapter 17. And listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the eve of his death as he prays to the Lord for those who are with him and those who would believe upon him through their word. John chapter 17, drop down there with me to verse 11. Now listen to the Lord's prayer, verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. That is an amazing thought, that the body of Christ, believers, would be one with each other as Jesus Christ is one with the Father, as the Father and the Son are one with the Holy Spirit, right? He's speaking of our communion together, even as we are in union with him. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you. These things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Listen, verse 17. 
sanctify them. Set them apart, right? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I set myself apart. I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, verse 20, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's speaking of you and I there. Right? Verse 21, that they all may be one. He's talking about our unity. He's talking about the communion of the saints, the communion of believers together. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is something that is entirely foreign to the world, right? Bingo clubs have no idea what's going on here. They have no experience of that. Elk lodges have got nothing on the brotherhood of whatever football team or whatever, right? It is, it's, it's not the same as communion of the saints, right? Uh, there may be brothers in arms. This is spirit-wrought communion. Do you see? There's a difference. This is a testimony to the world of the unifying force that is the Spirit of God in the church. In the glory which you gave me, verse 22, uh, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Communion of the saints, do you see? You can sense the depth of this Christian communion in the words and actions of Paul all over the New Testament. We've seen it in the book of Romans, right? Romans chapter one, verse 10, listen. Without ceasing, Paul says, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means, now at last, I may finally find a way, Paul says, in the will of God to come to you. Why? Verse 11, for I long to see you. Communion of the saints. I long to see you. Paul tells the Thessalonians, we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, that comment alone, you see, see Paul expressing his heart. We've been taken away, taken away from you physically. I'm still with you in heart, right? Endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. <laughs> Do we not experience that here? When, you, when you're not in church, you're missed. Is that so difficult to imagine? I long, I long to see your face. Some of you more than others. No, I'm just, <laughs> some of you are better looking than others. And I'm joking completely. We, we love our fellowship together, do we not? And as goofy looking as I am, I know you like to see me too. <laughs> we enjoy... A communion of the saints, a spiritual fellowship that is wrought by the Spirit of God among us. And you hear that in Paul's desire to be with them, right? In other words, there is a communion in the Spirit, a fellowship that Paul has with them that causes Paul to long to be with them, not to text them. <laughs> Paul isn't longing, I long to send you an email. no to see them face to face and heart to heart. Do you see? This is not some shallow, emotionally hyped sentimentalism. We have no ulterior motive, some backward agenda going on, trying to get our long arm in your short pocket, which is the way the, the world tends to think about these things, right? We're trying, you know, we just want your money, right? No. Our confession refers to it as communion in each other's gifts and graces. And it is wrought, it's a fruit of the Spirit. This communion, our confession says, leads to the performance of such duties, public and private, in an orderly way, as do conduce to or lead to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. Can always define how we bless or encourage one another in our communion, our fellowship together, but it's a reality of our fellowship together. And when I see you, you are an encouragement to me. I hope I am half the encouragement to you that you are to me, right? We have this fellowship, this communion together, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit that yields fruit. I wanna look at that. Turn to that text with me, Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, let's look at that text together. 
Romans chapter one, look there beginning in verse 11. Now, this is the text we've already looked at in detail on Sunday morning, praise God. And notice how this communion that we have in each other's gifts and graces compels Paul then to the performance of such duties that lead to their mutual good. In other words, this is not a communion that is merely sentimental. This is not a communion that is merely emotional. This is a spirit-wrought communion that bears fruit. It's a spirit-wrought communion, our confession says, that compels Paul to the performance of such duties as do conduce to or lead to their mutual good. Now, Paul, in this text, has four goals in mind. Verse 11 has four goals in mind. I long to see you. That's not I long to text you. I long to write a letter to you. I long to email you. I long to see you face to face, heart to heart, long to share this communion with you, one, that I might be a blessing to you and establish you in the faith. That's his first goal. Verse 11, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established or strengthened some gift of or pertaining to the operation of the Holy Spirit. That's what spiritual gift refers to. It's not referring there to speaking in tongues or word of prop. It's not referring to that. It's referring to a, a gift pertaining to the operation of the Spirit, a Spirit-wrought blessing. It's a blessing given by, imparted by the Spirit of God. And that gift is given through Paul serving them face to face. And as vital and as important as this letter is, this is not something that Paul feels as though he can do through a letter. Paul says, I long to see you. I long to be among you, right? Second goal that Paul has in mind, that we might encourage one another. Verse 12, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. It's interesting that our communion together is never a one-sided affair. <laughs> it's a mutual faith, a mutual of encouragement, both of you and me. We employ our gifts for the edification of the body, and when we employ our gifts for the edification of the body, we ourselves are encouraged. It's impossible not to be, right? When we get in and amongst one another, and we're serving one another in love, it's impossible that we ourselves are not encouraged by the mere virtue of getting in, involved and in jumping in and serving one another. That takes place, verse 12, through our mutual faith. We share the same faith. And we're encouraged by how the Lord has worked in us, encouraged by how the Lord works through you. It's uh, an encouragement for us mutually. The third reason of the four goals that Paul has in mind, the third is fruit. Verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now so that I might have some fruit among you also just as among the other Gentiles. I love this heart attitude of, of the Apostle Paul. Like, I want fruit. I want to bear fruit. I want to be fruitful among you. Paul desires to bear fruit for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that's a good attitude to have. The word of God will most certainly bear fruit among them and among the lost when Paul ministers. Paul knows it. So Paul wants to go there because Paul wants fruit. Fourth goal that Paul has in mind, that I might preach the gospel. Verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Romans chapter one, Paul anticipated that communion through their fellowship. He wanted to see them face to face. He longed to see them. Paul anticipated that that communion would be cultivated through the preaching of the gospel, through the preaching of God's word. Paul anticipated that communion as he served them, and he knew it would be mutual as they endeavored to serve in the fellowship with him. And this is fellowship in each other's gifts and graces. This is what Paul longed for, what he looked forward to in his communion together with them. This is what should be happening when Christians get together. When we fellowship, when we get together at the church, this is what should be happening. And listen, by God's grace, it is happening. I'm, we're so grateful for that. Could we cultivate that? Yes, and we should. 
Can we abound more and more in that grace? Yes, and we should. But praise God, we see this among us, and we should not take it for granted. We should not receive that grace of God in vain. We should be grateful for it. We should treasure it and want to see more and more of it. There's nothing better to talk about. There's nothing better to do than that. Do you see? Uh, talking about the Lord, talking about the gospel, edifying one another. And note with me, note, none of this merely happens by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. This is a spirit-wrought, spiritually fruitful communion in the blessings and privileges of the gospel. And the Spirit of God uses means. Let's take a look at those means from Ephesians chapter 4. Turn over there with me. The text read earlier in your hearing. Ephesians chapter 4. And look there at verse 1. Let's take a look at these means together. What are the means through which the Spirit of God works to bless our communion together? What are the means through which we have communion in each other's gifts and graces? There's something going on here. The Spirit of God is using means. First means personal holiness. Now, don't let that be lost on you. First means the Spirit of God works through in cultivating this kind of communion among us is personal holiness. Verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now notice, even from verse 1, how those personal fruits of the Spirit there are used here to emphasize a distinctively others-focused outlook, right? This is how we're to walk, and this is how we're to walk toward one another. Personal holiness here is characterized by lowliness, by gentleness, by patience, and by love. In other words, if you're not walking in lowliness, gentleness, patience, and love, you're not going to be a blessing to anybody, <laughs> Right? If you're walking in haughtiness, harshness, impatience, and hate, <laughs> you're not going to be a blessing to anybody. You're not going to, it's not going to be experienced as communion of the saints if you're not walking that way, right? It's going to look like disunion of the ain'ts. <laughs> if you're walking in any other way, but walking like this, it's going to be disunion of the ain'ts, not communion of the saints, Okay. So walk, I beseech you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. And that will serve as a means through which the Spirit of God will cultivate communion of the saints among us. Second means, second means, a diligently maintained, vigilantly protected, and genuine spirit-wrought peace. Spirit-wrought peace. Look at verse three. Endeavoring laboring, working to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Those Spirit-wrought fruits are the distinct blessing of our communion as saints and are impossible apart from our communion as saints, right? One of the reasons that we enjoy such a blessed communion is because we have this unity among us. And one of the reasons that we have this unity among us is because we enjoy blessed communion as saints. We're not talking about uniformity here. We're different people, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking. We have liberty of conscience. And we're not talking about uniformity, but we are talking about unity. We are talking about pace, uh, peace, unity in faith, unity in practice, resolving conflict, speaking the truth in love, correcting, encouraging, loving confrontation. It is amazing to me how in a, a vast major, a majority of churches, it's these very things that are completely abandoned, neglected. They will run from them. Instead of doing these things, brothers and sisters, we have to be diligent about doing these things, resolving conflict, which means you have to approach someone 
<laughs> and talk to them about a conflict that you have, right? You've got to do this work correcting. There are things that need to be corrected. And we have to be diligent, vigilant about correcting those things, encouraging one another, loving confrontation. What does Paul say? Convincing, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and teaching. I'm going to send an email. No, face to face, heart to heart, loving confrontation. And not only from behind the pulpit. Right? I can't just sort of retreat back to this little safe space and like speak over it to you. Right? We've all got to be involved in this work together. Loving confrontation, resolving conflict, speaking the truth in love, correcting, encouraging, convincing, rebuking, exhorting with all patience and teaching. Notice how the word of God keeps coming back, right, as a means through which all this takes place, right? Third means, third means, our gifts and graces deployed and employed in the body. Verse seven, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, this is a victorious, conquering king. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. He divided the spoils, right? Verse nine, now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. We don't have time to go there right now. We'll cover that another time. Verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. To each one, grace is given. Show up and put it to work in the body, right? The Lord has given gifts to men. Show up and put it to work in the body. Fourth, fourth means constant equipping. Constant equipping, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What we mean there by constant equipping is that it's not like, you know, I'm gonna go to church on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock from 10 to 11, and then I'll be ready. No, it's every Sunday morning from 10 to noon, and then it's fellowship with the people of God, and then it's back Sunday night for evening service, and then it's, in Bible classes in the morning, and it's over fellowship at lunch, and it's at groups during the week, and it's in conversations with brothers and sisters during the week, and it's having people over to the house. It's constant equipping, constant equipping. Again, what's common to all those gifts that the Lord gives to his church? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. What's common? They're all preaching and teaching gifts. They're all Uh, from the word of God. They involve the regular ministry of the word of God to equip God's people. The ministry of the word replicates itself in the ministry of the people. Do you see? Our confession says that saints by profession are bound to maintain a holy fellowship in communion in the worship of God and in performing such other spiritual services as tend to their mutual edification. That involves preaching the word, right? Preaching the word. Fifth means, we're looking at those means that the Spirit of God works through to cultivate communion of the saints among us. We're doing that from Ephesians chapter four. The fifth means is sanctifying, unifying, growing knowledge of Jesus Christ. A knowledge of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. And so we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In other words, understanding the truth of the gospel, we begin to be transformed. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds, that through the word of the living God, and then the whole of our lives. We are transformed through the word of God. The word of God is the means the spirit uses to do his work. And that is a means to effect our communion. Lastly, what is the fruit of that? We have these five means that I think are clearly outlined there for us in Ephesians chapter four, Lastly, that bears fruit. Look at verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, 
may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. We will grow up in all things into him who is the head, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together, that is the communion of the saints, do you see? Joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So how does the body grow? It grows this way, right? The people of God, every part doing its share, joined in it together by what every joint supplies according to its effective working, it causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In other words, there's something going on in our communion that is spirit wrought, that is the fruit of this work of the spirit of God among us. It's not an empty thing that we're doing here tonight. You may be sitting there, right? And you know, it, it, the smaller crowd on Sunday night, sometimes there's a little more social distancing going on on a Sunday night than there can be on a Sunday morning we're all packed in here elbow to elbow, right? But even, even sort of sitting over there and sitting back there and sitting over there, right? There's something going on in our communion through this means that the Spirit of God works through the word preached, works through our fellowship, works through our interaction to cultivate this growth in the body, the edifying of the body. The Spirit of God is working through these means to do that very thing. What is the unifying theme that runs throughout all of this? What is the unifying theme? What is one unifying theme? It's through our in-person, face-to-face, heart-to-heart, communion and fellowship together. It doesn't work the same way through any other means. The corporate worship, the corporate assembly of God's people is used as a means by the Spirit of God to effect this kind of growth. It's not the same as a letter. You can't do these things through an email, a phone call, streaming, Zoom, FaceTime, text. Face-to-face, -face, people, right? Face-to-face. -face. We have to be together. We need each other. We need to be around each other. We need to be in church together, at fellowship together, serving together. From the weakest to the strongest, we all encourage one another. We all have our part to do. As we consider the responsibilities that we have for one another, responsibilities that we've been given by the Lord himself, we have to ask ourselves, don't we, how is it that I am to get this done? How am I, the one and others, how am I to get those done? How is it that I can be faithful to love my brother as I am called to love my brother? How can I do it? Show up. <laughs> there is blessing and benefit in our communion. Show up. <laughs> What must that look like over years? Think with me, right? What must that look like over years of showing up? Loving one another, serving one another, being there face-to-face, heart-to-heart, doing these things. What must be the fruit of years of that kind of communion, right? Tested, proven, fought for, and won, uncorrupted, immersed in mutual gifts and graces, the fruit of years of the word of God being poured into one another through these means. Growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That we may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Right? The spirit of God works that fruit through these means. It's this that you're missing right now if you're at home because of coronavirus. <laughs> it's this that you're missing right now if you're at home for any other reason. <laughs> we should value this because the Spirit of God tells us this is what's going on here, right? And we have to... Take stock of how much we do or don't value this. 
It's the reason that the more that we grow as a church, the more that we love that, the more that we treasure that and cherish that, and the more painful it is when that communion is broken through sin. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact, don't we, that that most of the New Testament was written to communities and churches and not individuals. Communion of the saints is critical to the church. So important was this doctrine to the early church that it was enshrined in the historic creeds of our faith. Listen to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Now, well, Another time. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Universal Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We share communion with them with those who wrote this creed, do we not? We share it with the saints who are in heaven even now. The communion of the saints speaks to the unity of the church, past, present, future, through our common salvation. William Walsham Howe wrote a hymn called For All the Saints that I think well captures this. He says, O blessed communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine. Yet all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl streams in the countless host, all praising Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Alleluia, alleluia. It is an an innumerable host of saints from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered in unity and peace by virtue of our head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in union with him, praising his name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for eternity. The communion of the saints. God, may we abound in this grace. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, cause us, please, Lord, we pray by your spirit, cause us to abound in this grace. Lord, cause fruit among us through this means. Uh, May we treasure it and cherish it and value it as we should. May we recognize and acknowledge the work of your spirit among us through it, producing good fruit. And Lord, may we walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. uniting with one another in worship and in fellowship and in the preaching of your word and serving one another. May we love one another as we should. And Lord, I pray that you would cause us to grow, uh, cause us to increase in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, growing into the fullness of him who is our head. And may we enjoy the blessing of it, which is for our good. May it be to the praise of your glory. We love you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.